So good morning, everybody. My name is Leslie Christensen, and this is Times and Nazis course. As I told a little bit earlier, um, more students signed up than I expected. So I'm trying to go do some new things that I haven't tried before. So right now, or well, just a few minutes ago, you got a message with a link to a live stream uh, on YouTube, which should work. Um, it should also be there after the lecture, so you can go back and revisit things if you like. But as I said, this is the first time I'm doing this. I only got that camera up there to work two days ago. Um, so, and the microphones are still a little bit of an experiment since there's a small smart wireless thing down here, but it doesn't work for the recording. The only thing that works are those microphones in the ceiling in here. So everything you say right now will be recorded. I hope that is okay with everyone. Whenever the system has been reprogrammed, I will use the clip microphone also to get a better audio quality on the recording. But that's as good as it gets right now. Hopefully it works. Um, it also means that I booked an extra room, which is room 026. I also wrote that in the message. Um, it's in the other end of this building. Some of you may have been there before. There will be a TA there as well um, if there is not enough space in here um, when we get to the exercises later. So that was, the, you can say, a little bit of practical information. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'll take it from there. I hope we can be in here. There's always a few that does not show up, so we will almost fit in here. Nevertheless, we're just trying these things out. So that also means if I would like some feedback on how this actually works with the live stream after the fact. Um, there are some things that have been changed. For instance, I can change so that it's currently I just record the video camera, which is seen up there. I think right now what is streamed is my screen and only the screen. But I would also have to experiment a little bit with that. But the outline for the lecture is first a little bit more practical information. Then I'll kind of give some uh, examples just to introduce what we're going to be doing. Um, and then I will kind of get started on something that some of you may have seen and some of you may not have seen. And in the middle of all the technical details, I forgot my notes. So, practical information, well, we are here, and these are my contact details. I'm sitting basically 10 meters that way in my office if you need to find me. Usually, it's easier to get in touch with me by dropping an email than to find me, but I mean, feel free to drop by if that's the case. For teaching assistance, Michael will be here today. Tobias is not able to be here today. I will, of course, be here today. Uh, but I agree with a PhD student who's been the previous TA in the course to stand in for Tobias today. So we will be three persons when we get to that part around 10 ish. Um, so that was one part. Another thing which I will say more about, maybe not today, but when we get closer in a couple of weeks is how is all the assignment structure going to work because that's been changed relative to previous times so there'll be one assignment less on the other hand you'll be asked to peer grade each other and then i'll go in and check up everywhere there's a need for that uh, in particular with this number of students if i have to read every single report it used to be five reports times roughly 100 students that's 500 
when you divide by three, because it takes about 20 minutes to read each of them carefully, and you're down to quite some weeks of work where I do nothing but that. I don't think that's the most constructive way to use my time, and my experience is also from other settings where I've done similar things is that you, when you read what someone else did, you also learn something. I don't know how, what is your experience with that, but that's actually what I've seen. Because you see things that are done differently. Of course, the brightest 5% of you may not see something that is as bright as what you did. But then you'll feel comfortable with what you're doing, hopefully. Um, those that are medium bright, you will see some other medium bright, maybe some bright and not so good ones, and you will see what could be done different. Um, also presentation things, a lot of things you will see from that. Um, it's my experience from previously. So I think you will also gain from that. And I tried to say, I'll cut down one assignment, and that gives you some hours that you can use for doing this. Uh, but we'll get into that, and when we get to it, I mean, after each time, we'll do kind of sort of an evaluation of some kind uh, just to see how it's working. Uh, okay, so what is the purpose of this course? First of all, what is a time series? A time series is some data that is locked in time. Within this course, we will focus on data that is sampled or observed at equidistant points in time. So it's not a continuous time measurement. Does any one of you know of something that is a continuous time measurement? I mean, a recording of something where you do it in continuous time. Stop. Sorry? Stop. Stop. A dock? Stop. Stop market. Stop market? Yeah. It's not continuous time. It's discrete time because every time you have a trade, you have a discrete time event. It's not a continuous time process. There are splits, splits of a second in between each observation. So, I mean, yes, for you as a human being, you cannot distinguish it, but it's a lot of discrete events. They're just very frequent. I heard dog, and I was like, <laughs> that didn't make any sense. <laughs> so, I mean, Pretty much everything, whenever you have sound played somewhere, it's, digital, it's a digital recording nowadays. So it's sampled. And samples are not continuous time. So a lot of processes are actually observed in discrete time. I think the only thing that I can kind of get a hold on that is actually a true continuous time recording is a good old LP. It's a continuous movement there. There's no sampling. At least it wasn't in the old days. Now it comes from a sample signal, but it's a reconstruction then. Uh, we're getting back to that. So a lot of things are sampled in a way so that we can actually use what we're doing in this course. So here we have some data of some mink as muskrat skins that are traded 100 years ago. That's not the big deal. But the purpose of this course is how to make a model for the evolution of these things. That's the first step. The second step is, well, what should we use it for? We should use it for making predictions. Now, I assume every one of you had a course in statistics. And you can probably also answer, what is the likelihood that you would hit exactly on this prediction? Zero. Yes, because the probability <laughs> in a continuous, at least assuming that it's continuous with this an approximation here, you will not observe an exact value. The likelihood of that is zero. So you will always have some kind of a confidence interval of some kind. And that's one of the things, if you want to have a good grade in this course, I will say this repeatedly, it's good to make an estimate, but it does not provide much information if you do not associate it with some measure of uncertainty. It could be a confidence interval as given here, it could be a standard deviation, could be a variance, you get back to all these things, but you need to include a measure of uncertainty. Because the likelihood of observing what you set, what you predict, is zero. 
And I will, I will get back to that, and hopefully you remember at some point. So, I just realized there is some weird things with the slide. It chops off the bottom part of the slide. Um, I'll get by without that. So, starting to look at some other data, actually some finance data, as you just looked at. These are taken yesterday from Yahoo Finance, which is the part that is chopped off down there. Um, this is the chloroplast stock. And if you look at this process, what is your immediate consideration? Are you buying or are you selling? Yeah. Sorry? I heard something starting with a B. It's like... <laughs> buying. Because... Below the mean of the last month. Fair enough. On the other hand, you could also say there is a downward trend. So what are you, I mean, how much risk are you actually going to, to take? Now, if I, instead of looking at the previous month, look at the previous year. Okay, okay. There are ups and downs, so it's below the mean. That's probably not too bad to buy right now. Now, what then happens if you look at all the data that is there? It's sort of a different story, right? But just to say what you have here, how would you kind of describe that? What does it look like? These are the past 10, 15 years-ish. Sorry? A nice upward trend. And not just a nice trend. I, I want to do just to try one thing to see if it did the trick. It's not just an upward trend. It's almost like an exponential, right? So if I, instead of plotting the actual value out there, I plot the log of that, I get this. I get what is almost a linear trend. So that's pretty good, because it means, and on average, I get a positive return. So that's good. But the important measure is, when you look at some signal, depending on what time scale you look at, you will see different things. And the model that is appropriate for one situation may not be the perfect model for the global city. In particular, in economy, you will see periods, if you want to make good predictions, on the short term, you want to train it on the short term. If you want to make good predictions in the long term, you want to base it on something that is also related to the long term. It's kind of obvious when I say it, but if you haven't tried it, you will just try the usual method and you'll see that it fails for one or the other. Another thing that happens quite often, I don't know, this is the number of monthly airline passengers in the US. Starting back in 1995, yes, again, it's old data, because, but that's because I want to have this happening. And luckily, that has not been repeated. I don't know if you know what that is. 9-11, exactly. Um, so that's another part of this course. It's quite easy to predict from one year to the next, but you cannot predict the unpredictable. So the likelihood of this happening is virtually zero if you were to, to do this. So what we can do is to actually estimate was this an extreme event or not. I mean, yes, we know that it is or was. Uh, but in other cases, we can get back to and say, was there some, you can say, step in the response at that point in time, yes or no? Um, that's the, the one thing. But if we just make the prediction, well, we are, of course, up there. All the kinds of data, these are from VIX, which is waste for mining. It's a large uh, incinerary for waste. They also have a huge district heating network where all the heat goes out. 
And what you see on the top here is the heat consumption or one winter or a couple of years. And then the corresponding outside air temperature. Now, if you look at this, what do you think? What would it be a good model? Well, it makes good sense that when the air temperature drops, the heat consumption rises. Yes. So the first model you would make, based on what you said right now, mm -hmm. is just to make a linear regression model. And this, what do you think? I mean, if you just took the introduction to statistics course, I mean, and, and made that linear regression, yeah, I mean, I've seen much worse. It's actually quite nice. There is a little bit, the residuals are not evenly distributed, but I mean, it's not, it could be much worse. Let's just say it for that. But that's not the full story. That's not why we're here, because there's another way of looking at all these residuals. Before that, think of what we just looked at, these examples, <clears throat> and then say, what is a dynamical system? I don't know how many of you have thought of that before. What makes a system dynamic? What is a system in a yeah, dynamical system? Yes? It's not it may be linear, it may not be linear. That's not, but if you just go back to these data again, that's one example of a dynamic system. What you said up there at the back is, well, when the temperature is low, the heat consumption goes up. Yes, that's true. But why? Well, you could see that the slope there is almost constant. So you could say that parameters does not vary in the system. But what does vary? Not the parameters as such, but the state of the system. So when it's cold outside, it's not that automatically the heat supplier will generate more heat. They, they do that because some houses will turn up the thermostats, and then there will be a need for heat. So you have a state of the house that you want to keep at a certain temperature. So dynamics come in to the fact that you have some states, as in consider differential equations or difference equations. You have some states that does not change immediately. They change as a continuous thing. Say the temperature in this room, it does not immediately jump to something different. I can change the heat input to this room like this, if I had the right handle. But I cannot change the temperature in here. That will be a dynamic system. So whenever you have some quantity that you cannot change, then it's a dynamic system. You can say the airline passengers, yes, we could change that, but we can also consider it as a state where we try to model how does it fluctuate. How is the finance? How th That's more, you can say, uncertain by nature, but it's the same idea that you try to trace something that is not expected to just jump to infinity. So the idea is to consider dynamic systems are things where you have some core state. Um, it could also be number of animals related to the animal skins before. That's also something that has an evolution. <coughs> there are a couple of seats down here if you like. Please are there. Um, so, the next step from here, talking about dynamical systems, well, you need to look at how good was this model. I take these are the residuals from before, but rather than just plotting them with respect to the temperature and the heat consumption, I just plot them as a time series. I hope you can see that that signal up there is not what I call white noise, which is what you have down here. The difference between those two plots is that down here, I just pick the residuals up there and I shovel them in a random order. And I hope you can see that there is a marked difference between the two. So that is one thing we're going to get back to. Why is this? Well, that's because of dynamical systems. The heat consumption in one hour depends on this consumption the, the hour before. And you've got 
rapid temperature changes, but the house is not changing that frequently, that rapidly. So you have some feedback mechanisms there that you did not take into the model. That's why you can see the days up there. You can see there's a small oscillation per day in the top graph. Well, what does that mean? If you did linear regression on this, what was the assumption for doing so? To draw inference around this, to conclude about on this line is that significant. What are the assumptions that you need to kind of validate before you can say this line is okay? Yes? Now, I'm just thinking about an ordinary simple linear regression model. What are the assumptions? Yes? Uh, the assumption is that the variables are drawn from, uh, like they're identical and independent. Uh, exactly, so the, almost exactly. The residuals should be identically distributed and independent. We will call it IID independently and identically distributed, uh, which they look from here. I did not include the graph. I should do that next time I do this, where I combine all the points with lines. So you can see that what actually happens is that it, it bounces up and down every day, as you see it here at the top graph. So what you see here is that the residuals are nowhere near independent. And that's what we'll focus on. How do we deal with that? in a better way. <clears throat> so that was kind of a brief talking about some different cases that we can work with. Um, at some point, I would like to know more about what are your interests regarding different kinds of systems. So which data to use examples from, stuff like that. I mean, of course I have the ones that I could just use, but if you have some particular interest, I mean, I'm happy to change things like that. Uh, but I'll get back to that somehow in a, in a moment. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about multivariate random variables. We'll talk about, next week, the general linear model, which you have seen, at least in a simplified version. Uh, we will extend that. And then we'll, of course, talk about time series models and some theory of linear systems. If you are studying electrical engineering, I mean, there's a, be a lot more linear systems theory, but we'll do what is, you can say, sufficient for what we want to use it for. We will also cover, you can say, external input, sort of like the heat dynamics before. We cannot change the temperature outside, so we'll treat that as an input to the system. You can say the important things I want you to document is when you have a time series, you can characterize it. That means looking at correlation structures, covariances, same, same, just different. Consider stationarity, linearity. So if you consider the data that we looked at previously, are these stationary? Without having defined the term stationarity. I think we can all agree that this does not look to be stationary. Whereas if you look at the one year data here, well, stationary means that the mean does not change over time in this sense. Here you can say that's probably okay if you only have this data. But from this data, you will definitely say, well, the mean does depend on time. But we'll get back to that in more detail later. Here, is this a stationary process? No, because there's an upward trend, and there's also an oscillation. So, sorry. Yeah, but oscillation should be fine in regards to stationarity. Yes, to some extent. Uh, depends on the definition. <laughs> From a human perspective, yes, it's fine. From a statistical point of view, the measure is that the distribution at a particular month should be, I mean, a particular point in time should be independent of when it is. 
when you have a seasonal pattern there saying that Januarys are always different from the other months, then it's not fully stationary. Uh, so that you can say, in other words, you could say that's a global stationarity issue that we, from a human perspective, and then there's the statistical property of being strong stationary. So uh, we'll get back to that. We'll talk about filtering and smoothing of data. We will do some modeling, which is, you can say, you have some data and you want to do something with it. What to do? How to fit it? What is a suitable model? With and without external inputs. And then you can say the core part in some of these things is to make predictions. <coughs> we'll make the first ones later today, but that's where we want to be going. <coughs> so one question, also just to know which words to use today, is a little for me to know a little bit more about your background. I assume that you all had some kind of introduction to statistics course. So I would ask, what more did you take? I can suggest some courses, but how many of you had a course in probability theory? Quite a few of you. That's also what I expected. Um, that means that part of what I've seen the rest of today, you will have heard that in some similar context, but for some of you, it may be a little bit brief what I say, then I'll just recommend spending a little bit more time and reading chapter two. Um, how many have had a course in multivariate statistics, as in 0.2409 multivariate statistics or similar? One, I had a, a thought. <laughs> a few, okay, um, that's good. Because that's, uh, that's one of the places where sometimes the difference is that if half of the class had that already, I need to adjust how I, th how I do things. Uh, now I think I will just proceed as planned. Um, so regarding linear regression methods, I assume you've all seen that. How many of you have done that in a matrix vector formulation? In which courses? Just here or somewhere else? Yeah. Here. In which course? Uh, data analysis. The, which data analysis course? It's which number? Department. Sorry? It's a different department that you faced. Ah, okay. Then I don't know that particular course. <laughs> I know a lot of courses because I'm also head of studies for the AMC program. So I know, but I don't know the particular course. Can you give me the course number later just because I want to see it? Okay. Just to know the reference. Uh, are there any other statistical courses that you say, these are the ones that I've had that could be relevant? Kind of design of experiments or whatever? Not so much, that's, that's fine. Um, it's just good for me to know a little bit of where you are um, as to how for me to say things. So today, the focus is on multivariate random variables. Most of you had the probability course, so you will know about the first few points on the agenda. Actually, you probably heard most of it, except for the last one. Then you've, you've probably seen something that is similar. So part of it will be a recap, but I think after the summer break, it's not too bad to have a recap for an hour or so. Um, and I think now I spoke a little bit faster than what I anticipated. So I think before having a break, but I had a little bit early break today, um, I would like to know a little bit about what is your interest regarding modeling. <coughs> now, I have one from space. I can hear you took a space-related course. How many has a space-related interest? Some, or quite some. How many has, you could say, a financial relation, as was mentioned up there? Yeah. About the same number. How many has sort of a biological, medical, whatever sort of thing? Not so many, but still some. How many have a 
Oh, what, what are other, you can say back, I mean, there's a mathematical technology and you say the just mathematics thing. How many of you are there in that regard? If you have particular interests, I mean, I hope you flagged previously as well. Are there other, other particular interests? Yes? Um, we're a couple of students from environmental engineering, so more hydraulics. Yes. Good. Wind. Wind, yes. Good. I like wind. I've done that. <laughs> I know that's one case I would use with wind. Yeah. Uh, I would say any kind of uncertainty in energy systems like wind, demand, solar, whatever. Yes. So energy systems as yeah. such. You can say the heat, this uh, heating network as such. Many of these things, what I want to convey is effectively that it doesn't matter what you're interested in. The model is sort of the same. Of course, there are some challenges that in some, you can say, domains, there are some issues. In other domains, there are other things that are the issues. And other things just work. That was the problem there. That's also why I, I like to kind of use a little bit of different things. Um, I, I think I need to update my space case. But uh, so if you have some good data, the data that I have are, you could say, too old, too simple. Um, but I have, the, I mean, the perfect case, I just don't have the data from it. I don't know if you know what happened about a year ago regarding space and Denmark, to be a little bit of a nationalist. Yes? Yes, and you actually be here at BTU today at 11.30, uh, between building 3, 26 and 27. Uh, so if some of you walk away at that point in time, I mean, I'm not disappointed. <laughs> uh, I won't walk all the way he did, so that's okay. Um, so that's fair enough. but. I think one of the things that made time series analysis famous is actually stepping back to the Apollo missions. I assume that you all know what that was. Um, the challenge there was the same challenge as when the Soyuz capsule was docking into the uh, ISS. What do they need to know? Well, they need to know where they are and they need to know where they need to go, right? So. Just to give another example, this is basically what used to be the last assignment, but I will update that this year. Um, the challenge is, you could say the old story about Kalman, who invented this filter, is that you have a lot of measurements, but they are all noisy. And if you have a noisy measurement, then you don't know where you are. So you need to improve your information by combining many observations. So if you are, let me just make a very simple. So we have ISS over here. And ISS has some docking window here, just to make it simple. And then the Soyuz capsule has a corresponding, I know this is not the right shape of it, but just to draw something. Um, you want that to hit this one here. Not too hard. What do you do? What are they doing out here? I don't know exactly what they're doing, but now I'll just postulate something. <coughs> what they can do is to measure distances. And they can from here, you can recognize points over here. And you can measure the distance at any point here and any point there. That's, that's fair enough. But how do you maneuver such a thing? Can you control it? How do you do that? RC has thrusters. Yes, so it has some thrusters. What do they do? Well, they provide the thrust in the general area. So they yeah, but from a, a more simple physical point of view, what is it that you're actually doing? It pushes. It pushes. So you have a force for a period of time or a acceleration of momentum, so you change the velocity, but you measure distances. So you do not measure what you can control. Independently, indirectly, you can actually also measure the distance. I don't know exactly what they do. But you have to match both position and velocity when you 
get close enough. And you just have to get in within a neighborhood, then the docking mechanism will handle the rest. But you want to have a soft landing there. So you can say basically, if we just do it in 1D, x, then we can, then we have the position and we have the velocity. We have one more thing that is important. I don't know if you can think of it. Now we're starting the modeling thinking. Yes? Acceleration. We have the acceleration. We can write it here as double dot. That was not what I thought of, but we can just include it. Orientation. Orientation, exactly. So we'll just define uh, some angle here. Theta. What more do I need? I'll keep track of that. I'll say this is at a given time. What more do I need? Yes? Speed and acceleration of the orientation. Yes, so I need at least the angular velocity. Actually, I don't need the acceleration, but I think I'll just remove it right now. But this is, you need these four states to describe it in this domain just here. You can say for the so what I need is to measure all these things. I can measure directly the angle and the position because I can measure distances between known points. But I need to estimate these velocities. And if I don't know what the velocity is, then I don't know how to use the thrusters. So that's you can say estimating unobserved states. That's one of the things that we will also get to do. What we will say is that for a system like this, it will be in a linear setting, some matrix times what the system was a short while ago, which is the sampling frequency that we're using, plus some other matrix times some input <coughs> from the thrusters, and then plus some noise. We'll get back to this, but just to state an example. Now, when you're doing this for real, it's not a four-dimensional system as this one here. How many dimensions do they have? Well, three, but they're looking at a screen which is only, you know, an image, so technically two. But you have to, I mean, when it ducks, it's a three-dimensional docking, but including rotation? Yeah, well, it's not, but what I'm thinking of is, yeah, maybe I'm confusing the actual docking yeah. procedure, which is you have it basically in a stationary position, and then you will use a sphere into a certain point on the ISS. Yes. That's what I'm trying to but that's when you get very close. Yeah. That's, that's why I say, well, when you get close enough, the system here is, is simple, but when you're far away, you need to make sure that you get into the right position. You can say, there were, you do not, as I remember, rotation in one direction doesn't matter that much, but you have to match it there. So you need to get, you can say three dimensions to fit, get to the right place, but you also need this to have a rotation, so that point here aims at the ISS. Otherwise, so you need to have the rotation fit. So we have six dimensions of freedom. Each of them has a velocity associated. So when you are estimating the relative state of the capsule to the ISS, you need a 12-dimensional system, at least, uh, I would say. I'm sure that that's what they did. And that's what we'll do in a more sim simplified version later on. But now let's have a break and resume 10 minutes to 9.